Well, welcome to the Springfield Church of Christ. Very glad that you're here. You chose to worship with us this morning. It's good to see you as always. Uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Messy Church. And uh, today we're going to specifically talk about community. And so I have two things that I want to do here with this welcome. I want to show you how we're connected to a community in a broad sense and then connected to a community in a local sense. And so both, I think, are encouraging things. Uh, we'll start with a video from Hope Worldwide. And this is a new uh, program of theirs. It's an app. Uh, Hope Worldwide is the philanthropic arm of our church. Uh, many of you know that they've been helping with uh, you know, the, the, the crisis, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, they help with every time that there's a major catastrophe, Hope Worldwide is right there alongside the Red Cross to help and to serve. But Hope, one of Hope's uh, big ideas, one of their main goals is to be able to help people at a community level so that we're not just throwing money at uh, problems and then not helping uh, with sustaining those communities so that they can help themselves. So this first idea is an app that was born from Hope Worldwide, and it shows us a way that we can support people in a local way, in a unique way. So we'll go ahead and we'll roll that video. Dreams are a shared human experience. One of our most profound commonalities is our ability to hope, to see a better future. But the greatest dreams in the world are much harder to accomplish without opportunity and resources. At Hope Worldwide, we envision a world where we partner with our neighbors to collectively make a difference. But what if our neighbors weren't just the families next door? What if partnering with our neighbors abroad was simple? And what if we could do this together? Introducing Lend Hope Worldwide, a new program that connects small business owners with resources fundraised by you on our social giving app. Together we can raise the money needed by the single mother for her baking business the family rebuilding their restaurant, or the dairy farmer saving to buy more land. With increased profit, high quality training, and local mentorship, they are further empowered to create opportunities for their families and redonate their money to help others in their community. Lend Hope Worldwide is more than an app. It's a global social network where we can partner with our neighbors to inspire greater hope. Download the app today. Yeah, 
Yeah, so if you've heard of like Kickstarter or GoFundMe, this is like a way that we could help disciples directly uh, with programs that will sustain their future in their own community. So as we talk about community today, I thought that that would be a cool way to start, just another opportunity for us to give and serve and help. Uh, we also, though, at a local level, I mean, we, we're meeting right here in the Washington Street Mission, which is really cool. Um, and some of you know this already, but I wanted to share the news with you that the board of directors, our board of directors, uh, voted unanimously to gift the Washington Street Mission $1,500 from our benevolence uh, fund, our community partner fund. And so this is a picture of me and Derek and the executive uh, director, Brad, and we went and got lunch and we just uh, shared a meal together and shared vision together for what we can do if we work together in the Springfield community. Uh, he was incredibly uh, uh, grateful for the gift and um, that money, is just so we know, it's been sitting in our account it was designated to go to community partners from our benevolence fund, and so that's all of your giving. And uh, the board just voted to say, what are we doing leaving this sitting in our account when we could bless the mission? And so it goes things to fund uh, what they do here every day. Just recently, uh, because of funds like this, uh, the, the mission was able to uh, extend their hours into the afternoon. And so uh, that's just a great blessing. It, it used to be closing at noon every day, and now they're open until 2 or 3 because they got some extra funding. And so that's a great way for people to be able to be here and be connected uh, to the great, uh, really, the resources that the, that the mission is able to provide to the community. So uh, we're making a difference, uh, and we're, uh, I hope that we can continue to do so as we're connected to the work of the mission. So uh, I wanted to share that good news with you. We'll go ahead and pray. And then we've got a couple more songs before we share communion together. Uh, Michelle, can I ask you to lead us in prayer? Yes. Awesome. Uh, okay. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day to come together, God. Um, the sun is shining, even though it was raining last night, God. Um, we love you so much. We're so grateful to be together, to be a part of your kingdom, God. Help us to just fulfill your mission here in our communities and around the world, loving you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Bless this time of worship together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing the song, Breathe.
This is the air I breathe. All right, amen. Now, some of us may know this song, others may not, but we're going to give it a try. I love the chorus that says, Jesus Messiah, name above all names. So this song is Jesus Messiah.
be seated, everybody. Okay, well, if uh, you did a little bit of math, I bet you could figure out how many communion talks you've heard in your life uh, based on how long you've been a disciple or how long you've been coming to church. And for all of us, it's a lot. You start to rack up about 50 a year, uh, that's a lot of communion talks. So it's nice uh, every once in a while if we can shake things up just slightly. Now, I know that's dangerous because if you ever do anything out of the norm, people say, whoa, what are you doing? Don't do that. Uh, so it's not going to be too much of, uh, of us stepping off the path. But I thought it would be good as we talk about community today uh, for us to be a little bit more community-minded in how we talk about uh, uh, this uh, communion that we share. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26, a lot of us are very familiar, but I'll go ahead and read it. And then we're going to use it for a short activity. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to point out four things that I see in this passage, and then I want us to do those things now. Let's go to the next slide there. Alec, uh, I put them all in R's so that maybe we can remember. But in the beginning, it says that he is passing on to us, Jesus is passing on to us what was given to him. And so now we have to receive what it is that Jesus is giving us. Communion is a, a receptive act. We're recognizing that Jesus did something for us. And so we have to then accept it. We have to receive it. Uh, it's true that some folks don't feel that they are worthy to receive it. And yet we receive it. Sometimes we don't feel that we want to receive it because we know of the the responsibility of taking it. But it is something to be received, something that God himself passed on to Jesus and that Jesus then passed on to us and something that we now invite others to join in on as well. And so today, if you feel that you're not ready to receive, I would ask you to choose to receive. Choose to receive the communion that's being given for you. Second, it is being done for you. And so I want to encourage you to reflect. This is an act that needed to happen for our sins. And so we should reflect uh, about the importance and the weight of what it is that we are receiving. And we should reflect on that. It's difficult to reflect on why we need the communion, but it's important that we would do it. Third, uh, it is spoken about in the blood that this is a covenant. Now, a covenant means that there's an agreement, that we would act and that we would live in a certain kind of way. And so we, during this time, also need to recommit. We decide, you know what? I recognize that a covenant agreement means that I'm part of the handshake. I'm part of the deal that's being made. This is being done for me, and so I will act and live in a certain type of way. And during communion, we get to reflect on what was given to us, and then we can decide to recommit to the good confession that Jesus is Lord. And then lastly, we're doing it in remembrance. In remembrance of who Jesus is. In remembrance of what he was like, how he interacted with other people, how he served, how he loved. And so today we also remember what he did. So, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to propose a toast, because the way that this verse ends is in a manner that reads, I think, the best as a toast. Uh, go back to the verse for a moment there, Alec. In verse 26, it says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To me, that sounds kind of like a toast. You're remembering something. You're recognizing that what happened was noble, and you're saying, I stand by this and celebrate that it happened. And so today, I want to propose that you make a toast 
to Jesus. Uh, go to the next slide again. Uh, just back. Yeah. So when uh, when we're gonna take communion, I wanna I'm gonna leave this slide up. I'm gonna play the music that we've become familiar with uh, for communion, and I want you to to talk uh, to your neighbors and and talk about these things. Uh, maybe you need to talk about the fact that man, I I knew I need to choose today to receive. Maybe it's the reflecting. Oh, man, I need to reflect that this is something that I'm responsible for needing. Because of my sin, this is something that happened. Uh, or perhaps you want to share something that you want to recommit to in your life because of this communion. Or maybe it's just something that you love about Jesus, that you remember about him, and you can share that. But before you take the communion cup, uh, you can use that exact toast if you'd like, but with your friend, with your neighbor, say, to King Jesus until he comes again, and then go ahead and take your communion. Sound good? All right, let's have fun with it. Uh, and if we, if we don't have uh, the communion cups, maybe, Stephen, you can uh, find some people that still need them. Okay, very good. I'll play the music.
Okay, I hope that was refreshing for you. Uh, let me go ahead and pray for us, and then we'll continue in worship. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. I pray that uh, we would do all of, uh, all of those R words all of the time, that we would receive the communion, that we would receive it knowing that you want to give it to us, um, that we would reflect, that we would recommit, that we would remember, uh, God, that we would uh, do these things uh, for your glory and for our own spiritual health. God, that we would do these things knowing that you set forth for us an example which we should follow, one where we should die to ourselves and be raised again in newness of life. God, I pray that we live out that new life, that we are committed to it, and that we inspire others to do the same. God, we love you, and we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and stand. And we'll sing one song before the sermon. Ain't no rock yet, I'm gonna stand in my place As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name Ain't no rock, I'm gonna stand in my place As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name You got to praise His holy name As long as I'm alive to glorify His holy name Ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. Ain't no tree gonna lift its branches. I lift my hands to glorify His holy name. You got to praise His holy name. Long as I'm alive, to glorify His holy name. You got to praise. Sermon time, okay. We got a messy community. That's the title of the sermon, Messy Community. We're in this series, Messy Church, and man, sometimes we can be a mess. You know what a great example of that is? The International Churches of Christ. We're a little bit of a mess. Uh, you know, all churches have their issues, have their problems, uh, but we've, we've gone through some stuff, man. Uh, I started to go into some internet forums last night, and man, I wished that I hadn't. <laughs> I went into the wormhole, looking at all these different things. Just I'm like, let me get a grasp on some, I've got some questions, and let me figure some of those, let me, let me try to get some answers to some of those questions. Just, just, so, just so I've got some more context. You know, I'm a church history guy. I like church history. I studied history and religious studies and then became a minister. So those things are just kind of natural for me. I'm like, huh, it's, it's 2 in the morning. Let me just keep going deeper into this. Yeah, we, we, we've got a messy church. Now, I, I do believe that it's a group of people that's doing its best 
to uh, bring glory to God. Uh, but there's always issues. There's always problems. And I think that that's the case with uh, any group of sinners that comes together and does their best to try to move the, the kingdom and the gospel forward. We make mistakes. Um, but I appreciate that our group has owned a lot of those mistakes and said, man, what can we do to try to be better than that? Uh, right now, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm just going to keep on throwing weird stuff at you. We're going to show a video <laughs> that it, uh, was just released in the last two weeks or something, uh, but it comes from Disciples Today, which is not the official voice of the ICOC. In fact, the ICOC has no uh, hierarchical structure at all anymore. It doesn't really technically exist. It's a group of 700 plus churches that say, we're going to try to work together to advance the gospel. But that kind of makes you wonder, well, how does it, how's it all put together? And so this video attempts to explain how the ICOC is organized. And I thought that that would be helpful information for us to have. So we'll roll another video and then I'll get into the sermon. Okay. I'm Amber Rodriguez, and today we're going to explain how the International Churches of Christ are structured. Who runs it? How are things done? Where can I find the answers? We're going to answer all of these questions today. So let's dive in. The International Churches of Christ is a fellowship of 731 churches with a membership of 114,000 in 147 countries. These churches range in size from a couple dozen to over a thousand. These 731 churches are organized into families, and we have 34 families of churches. For example, there's the Indian family of churches and the French-speaking West Africa family of churches. So again, there are 34 families of churches that make up the International Churches of Christ. Each of these families needs to be organized. So from among the leadership of individual churches in each family of churches, regional family chairpersons have been chosen. These roles carry with them representative responsibilities. And in some cases, they also serve as a lead couple for the families of churches with the agreement of their local congregations to donate their time to help with the responsibilities of their particular family of churches, both on a local and global level. They aim to build and maintain unity among churches globally, represent their region in all discussions, and some even coordinate various task forces and service teams. More on that later. Now, how is each family of churches represented in decision-making and meetings? Well, aside from the chair couples, each family of churches selects commended disciples to serve as delegates. These representatives attend global meetings for ICOC leadership, create proposals for change, for action to build unity, and to increase mission effectiveness. They also promote global and local unity and work with the service teams. Each region is granted a minimum representation of one man, one woman, and one next-gen delegate. Additional delegates are added based on the size of the regional family of churches. It is exciting to see this increased diversity among the delegates. So what are the service teams? With the unity of the churches in mind, service teams address the needs of disciples and churches in their specific service area. The chairpersons of these service teams are selected and nominated by the service teams and confirmed or rejected by a delegate vote. Elders, teachers, women, campus, singles, youth and family, communication, administration. Each member of the service teams and task forces must be a spiritual leader that is commended by his or her local leadership. And last but not least, we have the Catalyst Team. And as the name implies, does not have executive power for decision-making, but instead catalyzes the decision-making process necessary for global planning, involvement, and cooperation. The Catalyst Team includes a diverse membership, including two elders, one teacher, two women's ministers, and regional family chairmen. Some exciting stuff has happened from this organization. The Catalyst team has hosted meetings and worked for unity around the world. 
Last year, the Catalyst team asked all the families of churches to pray about goals for their churches and share these goals with the other regional family chairpersons. All of the service teams have hosted conferences, many into the thousands. A lot of important work gets done behind the scenes. So let's review. We have 731 churches organized into 34 families of churches by region. Each of these families has a chair couple to organize and facilitate as they work to meet global and local needs. Each family of churches also has delegates that are involved in leadership meetings, decision-making, and creating proposals to better and further the church in unity and missions, guided and aided by the Catalyst team. The various service teams and task forces exist to serve specific needs of the churches and disciples. Each culture and country can organize how they see fit. Different regions are organized differently. We have set this structure in place and we like it, but we acknowledge that it's not perfect. This is a work in progress and we have much to learn about how best to maintain the precious worldwide unity of our movement as we labor to strengthen and grow our local churches against the backdrop of an ever-changing and always challenging global environment. Please pray for our ICOC organization that God will help us to adjust and adapt to finding the best possible solutions. You can read all about our leadership at icocleaders.org. The leadership strives for transparency and many meetings and decisions are documented the current list of ICOC delegates can also be found there. We hope you found this video helpful. And if you have any questions or concerns, icocleaders.org is a great place to start. God bless. Okay. Uh, so for some of us, you're like, okay, Josh, that's more information than I wanted. Uh, for others, you're like, oh, didn't know that stuff. And so uh, that video, it's on our YouTube channel. It's on Disciples Today. You can watch it again whenever you want to or uh, dig deeper if you'd like uh, on that website that they mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, I, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work that's getting done there and uh, no extra pay to do it. And so folks are just uh, donating their time to try to take this ragtag group of people and make something beautiful out of it or let God do something through it. Do you remember, though, the first time that you walked into church? Maybe it was this church. Maybe it was another church, you know, one of our churches or not. Well, we just, just think about that moment. What, what did you notice? What stood out to you? What were the conversations like? What were the people like? Now imagine this picture. So you walk into a church for the first time, and you notice that everyone is divided ethnically. Uh, white people are with white people, black people are with black people, Hispanic people are with Hispanic people. And then you look closer, and you see, as, as you're you know, getting to know this group, that they're divided, uh, they're divided by their status as well and their, their income level. So you've got the, the wealthy members sitting near the front and the less wealthy members in the back. And then you notice during the potluck following church that some have already been eating and are actually a little bit drunk uh, because they've been indulging so much. And you notice when someone got up to preach, many people, uh, 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 you know, some of the women included, were talking out of turn and having loud side conversations and there was no real order at all. And some people are eating food that had just been sacrificed to idols, and they're rubbing it in their friends' faces, even though to them this is a heinous sin. And you even overhear a conversation that someone's been in an immoral relationship, but not just with any woman, with their stepmom, and is boasting about it. Well, uh, the church that you've just walked into is the church in Corinth. Uh, and the letter written to first, uh, or the fir first Corinthians is this letter written by Paul to the Corinthian church. It was a divisive, immoral, idolatrous, wealthy congregation, and it is a mess. Uh, let's talk about Corinth a little bit more. So the, the site of ancient Corinth lies to the west 
uh, isthmus separating the Peloponnesian Peninsula from mainland Greece. After a century of desolation following Roman occupancy, in 46 BC, Julius Caesar moves a mixed group of Italians and dispossessed Greeks onto the site, and uh, once more, a magnificent city arose, but this time as a Roman colony. Uh, it became a melting pot of sorts. Uh, socially and ethnically, all sorts of people were in Corinth. Uh, but much like the challenges of the American melting pot ideology, it was not a booming success, and uh, it may be part of the church's divisions. It was just difficult for all these folks to get along. In the apostolic period, the city was a bustling commercial and industrial center, uh, boasting a population of almost 700,000 people. Uh, 30% were free, and about 70% of those were slaves. Uh, the economic and social, uh, this is the economic and social centerpiece of the Roman Empire. Uh, they hosted games like the Olympics, uh, and there was a distinctive cult of Corinth uh, that was a, a veneration of Aphrodite, okay, the, the, the goddess of love, which when Paul talks about love in 1 Corinthians 13, you've got to imagine that as the backdrop where he's saying, no, this is really what love is all about as he's addressing the church in Corinth. But this is a goddess of beauty and fertility, and she's identified with the Roman Venus. This is perhaps the most uh, American of all of the churches written about in Scripture. They have a lot of our similar problems. Uh, they, we, we can uh, see ourselves a little bit in them uh, to our shame. This is how the letter opens. So in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, uh, it starts like this. I don't think I have that. Oh, messy community, messy church, 1 Corinthians. Okay. I should have just left you with it, Alec. You would have followed along better. Okay. Uh, here's, here's how it starts. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Sosthenes, our brother, and to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, Corinth. It is a messy place. Uh, it's a messy church, and this is how Paul starts. He's writing to them. Um, I, I want to just list a couple of big ideas before we go, we go through this. So, uh, first, you can't have a perfectly, a perfectly clean congregation if it's made up of messy people who are in messy relationships. Uh, it just logically would follow that the content of the last two sermons bleeds right on into this one. If we're messy people, and we have messy relationships, at the community level, it doesn't mean that everything's going to be all nice and squeaky clean. It's just going to mean that we're a mess as well. Clean would have to start with clean people who are in clean relationships who then form a clean community. But that's not what we've got, and so we can expect that it is the way that it is, and that the way that it is is messy. Uh, only with spiritual direction can we make sense of the mess? And so Paul goes on to try to address some of these things. Let's get down to verse 10. It says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's people, Chloe, goodness gracious, that there is rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this. One of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? No, was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized into Paul's name? Let's take a look at these divisions a little bit deeper. Um, because we know just following personalities is going to lead to trouble. Uh, if we're uh, following these different leaders, that's going to lead to some divisions. But it's even more divisive than it looks on the surface. So take a look at this. Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ. You know what's interesting, though, is that Paul 
was a Roman citizen, and Saul, you know, grew up Jewish. By heritage, by culture, this is a Jewish guy. Apollos was a Greek. Cephas was, uh, you know, Peter is Jewish, but Greek. Greek culturally, Jewish religiously. Can you start to see why there may have been some divisions and that certain people were latching on to certain leaders in the church? Do you think that perhaps it was maybe based on who was most like them? Maybe somebody who was culturally Jewish. Maybe somebody who was culturally uh, Greek. Maybe somebody who was a Roman citizen. These things automatically in this melting pot of Corinth start to create some clear and logical divisions. Whatever chosen leader that they had would then lead to deep divisions in what they cared about. Look at the subdivisions and the culture uh, part of this. Right, Paul would uh, have Roman birthrights, and he purchased his citizenship. He was educated. Apollos, uh, you know, would have would have also he was educated as a Greek. But then the Jews uh, were outcasts uh, to this society in a lot of ways. In some ways, they were minorities. Culturally, all of they all have different ideas about all the things that we deal with every day, the food that they would eat, patronage, that's your professional relationships with people. Are you a slave or not? Just, just general knowledge, what, what they had access to as information, what they believed about sex and morality concerning sex. Uh, for the guy who was sleeping with his, uh, you know, his stepmom, that, I mean, it might not have been so big of a deal for him. It was clear in Paul's writing that, man, this, this doesn't even seem like it's a problem to you guys. Well, culturally, it wasn't so big of a problem, especially in Corinth. All of these things uh, Paul is highlighting in his teaching when he says, I want you to be united with the same understanding and the same conviction. That would have been a groundbreaking statement for him to say. For him to say that I want you to have the same understanding and the same conviction with all of these differences as, as the backdrop, that was an intense statement. You know, it is often our outside influences and interpretations that divide us in our community. It's how we grew up. It's what we know. It's uh, the school that we went to. These things do influence us, uh, influence us and change even how we can interpret Scripture and how we understand God. And so Paul is seeming to highlight a first level of division. This is a messy church with a lot of baggage, and it's a bit more understandable to see the challenges that they might have had uh, you know, in this young congregation because they're carrying all of this uh, baggage. Oh, a little bit deeper with this chart. So Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Christ. Um, the, the, the Bible title that we get for these different groups are Romans, Greeks, and Jews, or, uh, you know, the, the Jewish people, and some modern reflections, okay? Wealth and power would have been the language that the Romans were speaking. For the Greeks, it would have been knowledge and art and expression. For Jewish, they were guardians of their history and traditionalists. Can you make some modern comparisons to maybe some people that you know or even people that are in our, own, uh, in our own community here that maybe lean in one way or another. We are a messy church. We often can believe the lie that if everybody thought just like me, then we would be perfect. I often, uh, especially in my, uh, the, the youngest days of my discipleship, just, hey, if everybody just did this, then it would be all good. And uh, as I <laughs> matured uh, a little bit, uh, I found, wow, that's just not true uh, because I have so many blind spots. Uh, and there are some things that people really have on straight, and I have no, even, like, no concept at all about the things that they understand deeply. But if we believe that the church is, is just, if it's just operated in this specific way, we would be all good, and it's just not the case. Uh, if it, those people over there would get their act together, then the church would grow. Maybe, no, maybe there's a perfect system that we could follow, a perfect solution. Maybe if we had the right sequence of events and planning and everybody went through the same series, a book we could follow perhaps, 
then everybody would be good. What if, what if for membership we set certain requirements and obligations? That would help us out. What about organizational accountability? Hey, we all know we need accountability, so what if we organize that accountability and put a chart that aligns the church perfectly where everybody fits into a certain box? Maybe then that will work. You kind of see, and then some of you are like, yeah, yeah, we should do that. No, no, we shouldn't. <laughs> That's the trap. It's a trap. There, there is always a temptation to appeal to some of these things and then think that that's going to eliminate uh, our problems, but instead what it does is it naturally eliminates certain groups or subgroups of people who think differently than we do. You know, sometimes things go well, and other times they just don't. <laughs> uh, we can think that everything is just going to uh, go right, and maybe for a time it does. And then one of our blind spots uh, <laughs> takes us out. Uh, we don't see it coming when there are problems that are maybe there and have always been there. And uh, what we thought that we had slowly de decays away. Our temptation then, when things don't go well, is that we blame other groups or individuals for messing up our clean congregation or our ministry. Um, you know, I, I think that even in my own ministry time, there are folks that I just felt like I didn't have the bandwidth for. And I even struggle with it now. I'm like, I just don't know how to help so-and-so. And, and unfortunately, we all can sometimes just cut certain people out and say, man, I just don't know what to do, so forget it. And then we just figure, well, unity isn't as important as maybe doing something that I'm very uncomfortable with doing. Um, you know, this doesn't mean that if, if people are blatantly uh, disrespecting the gospel and not, uh, not living out lordship uh, in any aspect of their life, that doesn't mean that we just dismiss it and say, well, yeah, faith and obedience and allegiance to Jesus and repentance and baptism and commitment, none of that matters. No, no, of course. But we have to, we have to uphold that while holding on to and recognizing the tension of a messy fellowship of people who will absolutely falter and fail and rebel and then hopefully repent and be renewed and rediscover their faith. But they'll never get to the repenting and renewing and rediscovering their faith if they are dismissed and we ignore the tension. We have to live by faith through grace. We have to live by faith through grace. Yeah, we could maybe craft a, a perfect church on the outside that centered around all these lists of expectations, but that, that would eventually not be God's church made of his messy people that he loves. It would be something different of our own invention. And I'd rather not be part of something that we invent ourselves than be part of God's messy church. I like it better that way. Um, so, okay, well, what does Paul then do, and how do we then decide... Uh, or how, how can we live in this mess? Because it is a mess, but how do, we, how do we live in this mess? Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 10, and this gives us great insight. Um, it doesn't automatically solve all, all of our problems, but it gives us great insight for what we might be able to do as we live in this messy community. Verse 7 says, No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, uh, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Okay. So we often read the Bible kind of in a flat way. Uh, and this is not to say that we can't comprehend and then live out the gospel, but we are reading a translation, and we are a little bit separated from the original uh, text and message. We were removed from the culture. And so this leads to us kind of reading the Bible in a flat way. Uh, Remember when we talked about uh, last week, the difference of this individual mindset versus a collectivist mindset. There's just things like that that remove us from the text. The Bible is like 
uh, it's like like an iceberg, right? You can you can see the tip, but there's so much more underneath. And so it's important that we would identify and appreciate, and then respond to uh, what we see, but know that there are depths and intricacies uh, way deeper. Okay. Um, there's a guy named uh, Kenneth Bailey, and maybe we know him, but he wrote this uh, the, the the book. Uh, Paul through Mediterranean eyes, and so he's reevaluating this letter, for, you know, uh, First Corinthians, and he's using ancient translations, Arabic, uh, Syriac, uh, Hebrew, and he's studying all these things, and he identifies and expounds the text into uh, tr- traditional Jewish rhetoric to try to give us a better idea of what Paul is really saying, and so he looks at things like uh, chiasms and, and thing, things like that. Think. Um, like a haiku. If you're not familiar with a chiasm, maybe a haiku. But I, I bet if you know a haiku, you probably know a chiasm. How about Dr. Seuss? So it's kind of like Dr. Seuss is the book. There we go. We're, we're, on the same, we're on the same plane now. Okay, so let's look at Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 10, blown up in this form, okay? God's wisdom, God decreed, not understood, the cross, not understood, God prepared, God's wisdom. Okay, this is a, a way that the text works in a chiasm. Now, people have asked for this deep biblical study in our church, and so now you're getting it, so don't tell me you never got it. Here we go. Verse 7 is this first part, God's wisdom. It says, on the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery. Here's what God decreed, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. Not understood. Verse 8. None of the rulers of this age knew the wisdom, because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So we get to the cross. But as it is written, back to not understood. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human heart has conceived, get into God prepared. God has prepared these things for those who love him. Back to God's wisdom. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Okay, what a chiasm does is it takes similar ideas, and we're supposed to follow those similar ideas until we get to the center of the message, which in this case is the cross. The only thing that's going to allow us to be a community The only thing that was going to help the messiness of the Corinthian church was the cross. There was nothing else that was going to do it. What we did today for communion, as we reflected, as we remembered, as we recommitted, as we do all those things, that's the best we can do for our community. The very best that we can do is to focus on the cross and to remember its implications for our lives. God's wisdom, not our wisdom, is what messy churches need. Uh, Jesus didn't set up the church to be self-sufficient. He actually set it up so that we would be reliant on him. <clears throat> when we think that we found <clears throat> a, a, secret, uh, a secret sauce of, of doing God's work, or we've taken, you, you know, we've taken uh, steps to just figure out the best formula, well, that's when we take the first step down a long road of self-sufficiency and faithlessness, and we start trusting in the system more than we trust in the cross of Christ. Now, God's wisdom is, is hidden. Uh, it's, it's hidden wisdom in a mystery. It's not Roman power. It's not Greek wisdom or knowledge. It's not Jewish traditions. It is the cross. And so what Paul's doing is he's doing this chiasm. He's saying, nope, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. It's this. It's the cross, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's no three-step process. There, 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 there's, there's no, there, there's no uh, yeah, like I said, secret sauce to make it all work. It's only the cross. Um, yeah, I think that that, that book uh, is helpful. Uh, if you're if you're interested in it, that will unlock even more of, of things like this. But you know, this is this is important that we would recognize that, uh, that that the cross is the center of this message that Paul is giving. 
And it is, uh, it highlights that God is a relational God that is calling us into relationship. Because at the bottom, like the bottom line is that the cross is all about restoring a relationship that was broken by us. And God's revealed by the Spirit these things, that Jesus and the cross is the center of this message. Uh, God decreed and prepared for a cross-centric, messy church. There was no plan B. Uh, The cross was plan A. We always needed Jesus, and we will always need Jesus. Uh, The cross brought on the shame, uh, 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 brought on shame to Jesus and shames the ways of the world. Now, the cross disbands all divisive cliques and gives us a chance to be united. At the foot of the cross, uh, Galatians 3, 27 through 29 is true. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. I don't know if I have that up there or not. Yeah, it's, God, it's God's wisdom. It's not our wisdom. God has prepared these things for those who love him. He, uh, for those who want to love God, those who want to be loved by God, those who want to love like God, God has prepared these things for us. I love verse 27. Uh, for those of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. This is, this is great. You know, there, there's um, no rep, there's no uh, guarantee of a clean and an orderly group. Um, I look at uh, a, a, there are other examples like uh, Revelation nine or sorry seven nine through ten. I don't think I have this up here too. It just things come to me and then I don't get everything here. But it, the cross is the plan. It's not just a plan. But there's there's some messy churches. Uh, in, in John's vision in the book of Revelation, in chapter 7, 9 through 10, he says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried in a loud voice, in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. At the end of all things, the vision of the church is one that is united. It's one where all of these people have come together, and it's been accomplished only because of the cross of Christ. Right now, you know, we look around the world and just see wars and, and conflict. There, it, it's, it's, it's sad. It's, uh, it's hard to really even comprehend the suffering that people are going through. We have a... Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking a class right now uh, at the Harding School of Theology, and one of the students is, is there because he's been, uh, he's a war refugee from Ukraine. And every week he tells us, well, the fighting is a little bit closer to my hometown than it was last week. And we go through this like highs and lows just to kind of like get, you know, to talk about people's lives and it's like there's no high and low in that circumstance. It's just it's low. It's suffering. And 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 he he longs for the, you know, we were talking about ministry, and um, he shares with us that the, the that well the fighting is really close to my my hometown, and my family's still there. <laughs> uh, so there's no ministry high. There's just there's just pain, you know, in his in his broken English, trying to describe to us the best that he can. But one day, one day, there are going to be disciples in Ukraine and in Russia who maybe by the world standard could never be one that will share in uh, complete unity. The, the messiness of the world sometimes doesn't make sense. And we don't understand how the cross of Christ can even solve some of these racial, cultural, uh, or wealth divides. In uh, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 2, which we read before, it says, none of the rulers of this age know this wisdom. The, the Jewish leaders, Pilate, Herod, all those in the know and in power, they could not understand. The Romans had no time for a peasant king or myths of resurrection. The Greeks would despise the classless name of Jesus and his death and the folly of trusting in a crucified Lord. 
And the Jews were thrown off by the cross and by Jesus' lowliness. They thought that they were going to have a physical king to rule them. But it's what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and what no human heart has conceived, what God has planned. The pinnacle is the cross, and it's us being transformed by the cross. You know, in all of this mess, uh, we discover that God works in unexpected ways. Uh, what we perceive as unexpected, complicated, and undesirable, God uses to leap his mission ahead at a pace that we could never accomplish on our own. And so we need to be careful not to lament all complexity as bad or evil or a scheme of the enemy. Instead, we must discern the difference between good complexity and bad complexity. Okay? This is not easy to do. But let's not fall into the temptation of looking at the mess, looking at the stress, looking at the tension, and saying, man, what, what, what is God going to do with this? Because God always does something with that. That's how he always works. It's when, we need, uh, it's when we need to rely on him the most when we do not see a clear path or solution. You know, uh, we need to decide that we would not neglect one another uh, because of perceived messiness, but that we would walk with one another in the space where, or in a space where there is room for struggle and for difficulty. Uh, I think as, as we begin to close here, we've got to see our universal need for one another. Uh, we should stop assuming that someone is good, because, or you know, they're all good, because they've been around for a while. Uh, sometimes those folks need help and support the most because they feel tired or burnt out. Uh, we should stop uh, assuming that there's nothing to learn from those who are maybe newer in the faith. They certainly have wisdom and perspective that they can give to us. Uh, we should stop assuming structures and systems will guarantee righteousness because they will not. Um, and that's my temptation. Like, well, if I, if I could just get a perfect plan and schedule, that's going to make everything good. That's not true either. And we should stop assuming that we're all the same and that we all have the same needs because we're certainly not the same and we certainly have different needs. We're a body. We're a building. We're a field. All of those are complex objects, complex examples to try to give us some understanding that God works with messy things. All complex objects, uh, all, these are all complex objects that work best when every part is producing in its own way. We are a messy group. Uh, I hope that you're okay in that mess. We're a messy people with messy relationships in a messy community. We're a messy group of people reaching out for God together. And if we do this, then we do have a unique and powerful relationship and reliance on the living God who's given us the crucified Messiah. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, let's be that messy community. Alec, go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, as a messy person, it is nice to know that uh, I can be messy with my church family, and it'll be okay. <laughs> we can be vulnerable and share with one another and know that we're just trying to be more like Jesus together, right? So um, thank you for that, Josh. Um, now is the time of the service where we take up our contribution, and uh, obviously we can do that uh, through the Tidely app or uh, through the trays that are going to be passed. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and we'll do announcements as the trays are being passed. So bow your head with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you um, for today and just bringing us here safely and uh, being able to gather and uh, commune with one another uh, in your presence, God. And uh, I pray that uh, you just bless the money that we give um, and that you can multiply it and uh, help it bless the community um, as we uh, try to, you know, allot it to those who need it, God. We love you so much, uh, and we pray that all this in your name. All righty, we have a few announcements, um, and I'm going to trust that Josh has got it all behind me, so I'm not even going to look back. Uh, we've got, first up, Seeking a Benevolence uh, Coordinator um, to help distribute um, that fund that uh, Josh mentioned earlier to uh, those who need it. So if you're interested, please find Derek Williams uh, and talk with him about it. We also have Life Groups meeting Wednesdays and Thursdays uh, at 7 p.m. Oh, 
there we go. Yeah, the Prairie Land Service is going to be over there. Uh, let's see. It's over at Lake Springfield Christian Assembly at 10.30 a.m. will be the start time. Um, so we won't be here. Don't come back here. <laughs> uh, but there will be a live stream as well uh, if you're unable to attend. Um, we also have a board meeting on September 18th at 5 p.m. There is a Zoom link available if you'd like to attend, uh, as well as leadership team meetings October 4th at 7 p.m. at the Lutz's house. Also, we have Midwest Teen Homecoming this year, October 8th from 7 to 10. Uh, it costs about 50 bucks per person, so if you would uh, have a child who's interested in attending, that's going to be on the Chicago Church's website. Uh, for campus students, there is the Mac Retreat, uh, October 21st and 23rd. Uh, more information also on um, the Chicago Church website. And there will be a parenting class again uh, on October 21st from Ruben and Barbara Marbury uh, about generations. And uh, there is also information on our website for that. So um, with that, we have a closing song. Yep. And we'll be good. Uh, yeah, th this came up quick, but next week we're at we're at uh, Lake Springfield Christian Assembly. So if you come here, hope you have a great Sunday. But none of us will see you, so don't come here. Go there, uh, and uh, you can bet your bottom dollar uh, that address will be in your uh, email, and so you can take a look at that. Ten thirty start because we want to host our guests well. But we're it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there's going to be a bags tournament. I've been practicing, so just watch out. Uh, it'll be great when we, com when we combine all three churches. Uh, other things to remember, uh, the pavilion uh, has great picnic area seating. Uh, there's going to be a bouncy house for the kids. There's going to be a, a big trailer grill that we bring. So if you bring your own meat, uh, uh, we'll bring the heat and then uh, grill up that food for you. So uh, you can bring, you know, just, you know, sandwiches or whatever. But if you want to bring some burgers or brats or whatever, uh, there's a grill that we can use to cook that stuff up. Um, it'll be a great time. Plan on, on coming and eating lunch and staying and fellowshipping. A great time and a unique time to be able to worship with our brothers and sisters from Champaign and Bloomington. Check your email. That's the most important thing uh, for this next week, that you would be there at that service. Prioritize it. You will not be sorry. Let's go ahead and stand, and we are going to sing this little light of mine. All right. Light of mine, don't you know that I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, yeah, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let
it shine, let it shine, oh yeah. All right, have a great Sunday, everybody. Enjoy yourself.